everyone, and wel welcome again to my audiovisual channel. I am Gabriella Handel, a draftsman and the host of this show, A Conversation About Art, during which I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 26, and I will have this conversation with yet another draftsman, Guno Park. Um, so, again, I'm pre-recording this on Zoom. I like the result of this so far. I'm definitely going to practice, uh, I'm going to try to figure out how to do uh, so that I can manipulate more of the video itself for future episodes. But anyway, the thing is that Guno is awesome. I have worked with him, I have drawn alongside him, and I've also worked with him as a model for his classes, and he's really awesome, and I'm going to... Um, he has a very adept drawing skill, and um, anyway, I think I'm going to gush a little bit more... <laughs> about him when I start talking to him uh, in a little bit, and yes, it's very exciting that I can uh, pick his brain about these subjects. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Remember to like this video, remember to share it, leave me a comment with whatever uh, thoughts you might have on the subject, um, and remember to subscribe to this audiovisual channel. And uh, talk to you soon, enjoy the episode. All right. Guno Park, thank you so very much for talking to me today. Welcome to my podcast, The Conversation About Art. You are episode 26. Um, so please, why don't you tell the people who will listen and watch this episode who you are and what you do? Oh, uh, hello, Hi. Gabriella. Yeah, thank <laughs> you for inviting me to have a chat with you. Of course. Um, I'm Guno and I draw. Uh, I'm an artist here living, I live in. New York, Brooklyn, New York, and yeah, I'm a drawer, uh, I draw figures, I draw urban spaces, uh, places that I experience myself around the city, my surroundings, and I draw animals as well. Uh, I'm primarily a drawer, and uh, I like to use ballpoint pens and pencils and ink, uh, and, and I like to use watercolor uh, markers. Uh, lots of uh, drawing me all the drawing meetings, I guess. Mm -hmm. I also teach drawing uh, regularly. <laughs> and I also actually teach online for a uh, school called Art Center. Okay. All right. Um, I listened to your interview with art brand podcast and I really liked it and I recommend it to whomever else wants that you know that wants to know a bit more about about you and you know about Guno and, and his artistic prowess um, and I really I found very interesting what you were saying about your journey with the drawing um, and well I listened to it a while ago so correct me or you know like polish whatever it is uh, I, I say that I remember from the conversation but um, you have been drawing your whole life, just, uh, you know, you started up very soon, and uh, I, I think I remember from the conversation uh, with Art Grind Podcast that your parents were encouraging, uh, but I feel like the, I, I got the impression that the encouragement wasn't in the way that the parents are like, oh, that's cute, oh, keep doing it, yeah, good boy, you know, that kind of stuff, it was like more like a serious sort of encouragement, or like, I feel like there was this uh, seriousness to your drawing in the sense that it kind of was like a like an actual way of communication very very early on or like that's kind of how you think of it sort of you know like I feel like there was a seriousness rather than than the uh, I keep using the word serious uh, I'm not entirely sure if it's accurate or not but but I'm just thinking of like my relationship with drawing early on it was rather casual and so, like, in, in your sense, it didn't, it, you know, listening to you talk about it, it didn't feel like it was casual. You were very committed to it. So I'd like it if you kind of talked about that a little. Wow, that podcast was a long time ago. That was a while ago, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think I actually listened to it after uh, I had uh, recorded it with them. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's very interesting to hear your uh, thoughts about it. <clears throat> It's a little blurry there. Oh, uh, oh it's because my head got closer okay. to the camera. It's like a, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, seriousness of drawing. Yeah, that's interesting to think about. Um, but that's also, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's believable that you, uh, you know, you gave me something to think about. Definitely. Mm. I'll think about that um, after this talk, I think. But just at the, the tip of my mind, uh, I don't know if it was the, the seriousness. It was something um, that from a very early age, it was encouraged. Uh, but I had, you know, naturally just wanted to do it all the time and I think partially uh, growing up I actually didn't even quite realize this but um, many many members of my family uh, like did art professionally uh, mm -hmm. when I was growing up like my aunt was a graphic designer uh, my mother's father my grandfather was uh, and still is um, calligraphy artist oh, and uh, yeah. he does beautiful I have some of his work here too hanging in my, my studio um, so I guess I was always like uh, immersed in it or just had it around me mm -hmm. and my mom really liked drawing when she was younger too but you know she was raising us and, and she was busy being a mother and a wife and you know supportive person of the family yeah. Uh, so whenever she did get a, a chance to, I saw her doing stuff, making stuff. And I remember her taking uh, floral design uh, courses, and I remember her taking other artistic sort of like lessons and things. Um, mm. From that that era, uh, a lot of people in my mom's age group uh, didn't end up going to college. So my mom didn't go to college, but she always wanted to go to college for art. Mm. Uh, but she had us fairly young and I'm the youngest of three my brother's five years older than me and my sister's in the middle and so she raised us three um, but when we got a little older whatever time she had she would always see these uh, experiences out now and I had to be part and so whether, whether it was like, like quilting or, or sewing or uh, floral uh, many things and like I said also seeing my aunts and my grandfather always making it like the thought of drawing was just this like uh, natural sort of extension I guess mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so even now that I'm explaining it more and more uh, it does sound serious like <laughs> thought about this stuff pretty seriously but I just I guess naturally just gravitated towards wanting to like just move my hands and mm -hmm. draw all the time and just doodle. Maybe maybe it was uh, a coping mechanism or something. You know? Okay. Uh, I I haven't really done a, such a deep psycho you know analysis of myself, <laughs> but uh, maybe maybe that'll reveal some things about uh, why I thought about why why I thought about drawing way I did since such a young age uh, but I, I remember basically I remember just always just like having either a notepad or even uh, I think I was talking about this during that podcast but, um, uh, but my mom would save uh, a packaging that was kind of like just clean pieces of cardboard you know, that held garments mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in the right shape in the plastic bags and stuff. Yes. But they were like perfect little size, you know, cardboard. One side was kind of glossy white and the other side was like this rough brown. And it gave you two surfaces as well, yeah. you know. Um, so if I would take, you know, oil pastel to, to it. I could create like different colors, you know, and with 12.10, on the on the glossy white side you know it would draw really nicely mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I was always conscious about uh, just filling spaces like you know if i see a 
piece of paper somewhere. I, uh, the other day I was uh, over there in my living room. But, uh, you know, like the Met, when you go to the Met and you get one of the maps, like mm -hmm. the very front page of the map is red. It has like the Met or whatever logo on it. But there's a whole like red, blank, red space. Yeah, thing. yeah. And, you know, I drew on that part. Uh -huh. I sketched on it while I was waiting for mine because there was a big line to get into like the new Met, what is it, uh, American Passion something show um, where it goes over like a number of decades of American Passion. Uh, and there was a line. We mm -hmm. waited in line for like five minutes. And uh, it's like, you know, we could be waiting, waiting in line, waiting in line. It's kind of going slowly. My wife is here chatting. Uh, and then there's this like really well dressed uh, older couple right in front of us. Mm -hmm. So it's like I see this red blank space. I see this really nicely you know, dressed couple in front of us. Of course, I have my pen on mm -hmm. me you know, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Like whip it out. And that's like a regular, normal. It's not even like a choice. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, it's a choice. But yeah. Yeah. I like to think of it as something that is such a uh, innate uh, extension of myself. Yeah, yeah. That it's this natural, like, it's like a, yeah, it's natural. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's serious. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I definitely like I still I wonder if uh, the, the term serious is like accurate enough for 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 what I mean and and like uh, now that you were talking about the people in your family because I mean it's pretty close people that you obviously I mean you saw often and so you saw them uh, you know doing art related things just par for the for the course and you know now that you're mentioning that it I, I get the impression so like I'm again I'm like speculating about what you uh, what it might be like to grow up surrounded by that maybe having those people having careers in artistic relate in in art related pursuits uh, you know art related careers maybe witnessing that from a young age kind of removed any and all um maybe maybe removed some of the casualness that could be attached to art uh, and it also i i i would think that it would also remove the the stigma that comes with i mean i don't know um how aware, I mean, you probably are aware just as well of the stigma that comes with the artistic career of the drunkard or like, you know, like a drifting life, like this kind of stuff. That's kind of like the, obviously the other side of the coin of the artistic life that it's like, oh, you're always struggling to make money or like these stereotypes, you know? So I, so I, I speculate that having seen really, you know, people that you're related to close to you that you see often and they have these it's par for the course just like every uh you're aware that they have normal lives where they have uh you know normal healthy lives where they have a good job w doing art that they enjoy and you just see you just grow up with that it makes a lot of sense that if you if you ended up like gravitating towards art that you would take it uh as the as um the example they gave you you know with their lives you know so do, what what do you think about that? Does that make sense? I mean, Does that seem right? Yeah, that, that, that seems to make it make sense for sure. Um, you know, like the idea of having um, many of my close family members be involved in art was definitely uh, something that took away any doubt or, or like judgment maybe you know even yeah like, judgment too for sure uh, you know mm. uh, but like it's you know like my dad as well um he really really wanted to be a singer a singer um, yeah okay and you know he went to school for business because his father who i never met i never met my my grandfather or my dad's side it's uh passed away like pretty like pretty recent like pretty soon before I was born like a year before I was born okay so like I missed him by a year uh but anyways like he was definitely like this like hardcore businessman mm. 
and a lot of my dad to kind of keep keep going with it. You know, yeah. be like build this huge thing in Seoul. You know, back in the day, and so my dad, even having wanting to be a singer and, and study music, he was reluctantly sent to like a business school to learn all that stuff. And you know, he was the only son of the family. He was the oldest son of the kid mm-hmm. in the family. Mm-hmm. You know, he was like deemed to take over, you know, whatever my grandfather told us. And so he also, he might, I feel like my dad also at heart is an artist or a musician. And he kind of uh, reluctantly uh, became a business consultant. And so when he was raising us, me, my sister, and my brother, like even aside from the fact that my mom's side of the family is very creative, very artistic. Like even my dad, at a, from an early age, was telling us to really do what we want to do, and really think about what it is that will make you uh, the best human being, the happiest, the most talented, the most successful human. Mm-hmm. I don't think he, you know, used exactly those words when he was raising us, but yeah. it totally felt. Uh, like it was my choice that uh, where what school I wanted to go to or what I wanted to study, uh, what I wanted to do with my free time, you know. Um, like we definitely were all sent to you know like piano classes, all of us, all three of us, uh, and other music classes too, because you know uh, I guess that's the thing you do, right? You get your kids to try different things. But you know, things wouldn't stick with me. Like certain things, like uh, piano, wasn't really you know sticking with me. And, uh, so I just you know naturally went to art. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just kept doing art. So they basically were like, okay, you like art, so let's just keep you know pushing you towards other art stuff. Then, yeah, know, yeah. To, to make you spend your time. Like my brother likes sports, so after he was like you know connecting with it, like they sent tennis lessons for years and he played tennis. Uh, my sister, I mean, my sister was dabbling with everything because she couldn't really figure it out. Like, I mean, she did everything too. She did music, um, but she ended up doing art as well. Fine uh, art like you? Yeah. Okay. She went to the same art undergrad. Well, she went to the undergrad. I ended up going to later. Um, but she kind of like left art and became uh, more of a makeup artist. Mm-hmm. Uh, she actually went to school for like effects, special effects. Yeah, makeup. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's not. It's not. Yeah, that's. Uh, I feel like that's for sure. Like a branch of art. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and my brother, actually, he went into other things, like sciences, at the beginning of his uh, academic career, but he ended up going to school for photography. Uh huh. And you know he. he a photographer now he's doing other things mm. uh you know but um yeah he became a photographer for a while okay so all all three of us um I would say did creative things you know uh, with our free will yes yeah i think um recently i've been thinking about that uh you know because uh, i've been thinking about the two sort of main things that seem to happen with parents and children, because it's there's there's the one that you were talking about just now about your grandfather with your father, which is like he really wants the kid, you know, the kid to follow in his footsteps and stuff. And there's like there's like two ways to that you can get to do that. You can like really kind of like borderline bully your kid into doing it, or you can kind of be encouraging and inviting uh, to the kid. Like some people do that, you know, they'll, they'll or you know, that's kind of like uh, arguably traditionally how it was, it was done in other occasions where like the the dad would take his son to, I don't know, the farm or whatever, and then the kid would participate with the dad in doing this stuff. And then because of that association, that positive association during childhood, the kid ends up doing that anyway, you know? And like uh, the, uh, the other one where you kind of, whatever it is, you bully your kid into doing it or you guilt them into doing it, uh, into doing it, or you're mean to them until they do it or whatever, until they do what, what the, until they do what the parent wants them to do. Um, you either uh, like win, quote unquote, at getting the kid to do what you wanted them to do, or they just completely rebel <laughs> and just 
do everything to piss you off <laughs> and just do the opposite thing, you know, and that seems very interesting. And um, anyway, I've been thinking about that. And yeah, that's that also seems really interesting uh, that you were able to witness that or, you know, like maybe now you're thinking about it and that stuff. Okay, so um, you mentioned that when you draw, you, uh, you know, and I mean, I've seen you also working in any and all drawing medium markers, ballpoint pen, graphite charcoal, over all kinds of surface, surfaces as well. Um, do you have, uh, all right, so all right, so I have like a couple of questions about that. Do you have like a, a kind of like a ranking, a like, like a top five that you prefer of these mediums? And why do you think that you prefer like the one that it would be your favorite? Like your top one out of that ranking. Um, I used to, I used to have uh, stronger preferences of mediums. Uh, now, preferences are a bit more spread out. I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. uh, because the reasons of why reasons why I, I, I prefer certain mediums over others, the reasons have changed. Um, I used I used to as a young younger uh, drawer I used to uh, draw almost a, you know ninety percent of the time on newsprint uh, with with uh, compressed charcoal um, or with uh, like this oil based pig charcoal. Thing. Uh, oil based pit, oil based charcoal. Right? Mm -hmm. and I used to almost exclusively draw with those or compressed charcoal sticks on these prints because of the smoothness and the uh, contrast I can achieve very quickly. And so, you know, gesture drawing, I think, uh, was like, you know, my, my most favorite thing to do for a really long period of my life. And so that's like a major thing that sticks out in my brain. Um, but following those years, I think ballpoint pen became uh, really like something mysterious for me and uh, also very easy, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so those two things became very uh, much of a, a challenge to, uh, I guess, figure out, you know, that mm -hmm. permanence of the ink uh, on on paper, uh, I would say you know, any any smooth like hot press, you know, uh, hot press watercolor paper or like bond paper, uh, illustration board, uh, back in the day, those were like, you know, prized surfaces that, mm -hmm. that would wait for me until I was ready kind of thing. And ballpoint pen is just was was just so um, so fun. <laughs> yeah, solve. yeah. Okay. Just to think about it as a as an as an immediate immediate value uh, tool, uh, as well as something that is permanent, and you know something that also is not very fun to draw with all the time because it it like. Perhaps I mean, you know, like it's all the ink that poops out. You have to find the right temperature. I start, you know, start thinking about everything. Like, what's the humidity of this room? Uh -huh. um, you know, what time of day is it? Where's the sun? Where's the moon? Like, <laughs> why is my ink like, you know, like gooping today so much, and other days uh, so dry? Uh, you know, is it the temperature of my hand? You know, am I warming up the ink too much? Um, and you know, after after just that kind of relationship of depth of uh, thinking about it, then I achieve some of my favorite drawings that I've ever done uh, in my lifetime with these small point ten. It's like, you know, this is never going to go away as something that I treasure. Uh, whether people think it's temporary, whether think people think it's not archival, you know. Uh, I guess that's not 100% of the reason why I do this mm -hmm. Okay, um, but you have, I mean, 
were you using ballpoint pen before it became, you know, how long have you been using it and how long have you been using ballpoint pen to draw and when and at what point would you say it became like this top tier drawing tool for you? Um, I mean, I used ballpoint pen as, as a drawer since I was a kid. Right? Mm -hmm. Whenever it was around. Just like my mom would give me the piece of cardboard that was holding up the, you know, the clothes. The, yeah, the, the, uh -huh. the undershirt that we bought. Um, she would also hand me things that were around the house, you know. And mm. So I remember the uh, uh, there's this brand of pens in Korea called Monami, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just the cheapest pen you can get. You know, it's a quick, clickable pen. I have one somewhere. You can still buy them these days. You know, they're 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 around and they have like metal versions of them now and stuff, but. I really remember that quickie uh, plastic Monami ballpoint pen uh -huh. uh, and using, having a couple of those in my pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't even like five, six year old kid, you know, enjoying with it. Um, and so it never wasn't, uh, it, it was, there, there wasn't a, a, I don't think there was a point in time where I thought, pen is going to be my next, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the thing that I draw with, you know, mm -hmm. it's always there. Um, but I guess as I grew up, as I progressed, better, got better at drawing, better at looking, better at seeing, um, I just also got better along with the same tool, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, I think there was a point, as you mentioned, um, when like ballpoint pen Kind of like using a ballpoint pen as a as like a, a viable art tool uh became kind of like a story you know like all these articles started coming out mm -hmm, started mm -hmm. coming out of them you know uh and all these companies that perhaps weren't were making ballpoint pens for a long time but uh weren't necessarily making them or marketing them as as like a drawing tool yeah started to, you know, do it, do that mm -hmm, more and more. It's like, they've always had pens, but now they can kind of like, you know, get some artists to use it and draw with, or, or artists have already been doing that anyways, you know, taking a normal writing tool uh, and using it as a drawing tool. And as much as it is definitely, you know, primarily in the people's minds, it, it, it's, it's a note-taking tool, it's a sketching tool, it's a doodling tool. Um, I think there was a moment in time where I did consciously think about um, for a while, especially when there's like articles and books and stuff coming out. Um, this is a cool thing. This, mm. is a, this is a really interesting uh, moment, I think. Um, you know, like accessibility and how, how cheap the pen is to produce. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just that probably, like, I don't even know what, the, you know, majority of the people in the world have touched and used the pen. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's a very interesting thing, taking something so common and mm -hmm. using that as a tool to create phenomenal images. And, yeah, yeah. You know, organization with arts and lines uh to like then be like you know this is kind of a thing you know a thing you already know. Yeah. okay okay um <laughs> yeah i i i didn't personally experience the articles the art the write-ups you know about ballpoint pen drawings but i do know what you're talking about for sure um uh, i do remember seeing like, you know, the stuff when stuff, uh, social media and whatever, and like, um, images go viral, started going, going viral and whatever. And it's like, uh, the, it's the, uh, the ballpoint, the really big ballpoint pen drawings of that one guy. I think he's from Spain, whatever. I mean, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily matter. The thing is that I totally know what you're talking about, uh, yeah. where that person making those drawings, just using ballpoint, the drawings were gigantic. Uh, he, uh, that, that individual kind of made a, just opened up a whole ass other genre of 
you know, for people to participate in, not just making the work, but also people uh, to view the work to a, you know, as viewers. Um, so, all right, so in that case, would you say around that time, you started kind of shifting from the, the, um, the pit charcoal you were talking about into ballpoint? Do you think it coincides with that? Oh. Um, uh, no, the, you know, these, these mediums, I'm, I always use all the mediums all the time. Uh, that, yeah, that's true for sure. Yeah, so I don't exclusively call myself uh, a ballpoint pen artist, mm. or, or I don't think I ever will consider myself a certain just draftsman artist you know what yeah I mean? uh, but like you know during those times during those years a few years ago um you know i was part of like many of those books many of those articles and people started calling calling me mm. oh you're the, you're the ballpoint pen artist <laughs> i like ballpoint pen i like <laughs> Um, I guess a lot of my drawings that I've been doing with painting with Paul have, have been out there in the world recently. So yeah, I understand, but it, I guess you can't pick and choose like how people you know perceive you as an artist, right? Yeah, yeah, I, that's I'm, true. I'm just happy and excited that anybody would even be interested in what I'm making. You can call me ballpoint fine artist for a while. <laughs> Uh, okay. But it's not like I'm exclusively always using ballpoint pen. Like, what's funny is like recently I'm, I'm like I work with zebra pen too, and I'm, I am from morning ballpoint pens, uh -huh. <laughs> kind of as an art tool. Uh, I am, uh, so I, I can't deny it. But uh, so, you know, that's that's where I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's fair. I totally understand. I mean, it's like the impression, the impression, uh, you know, the whole world or whatever it is, the impression the world will get based of based off of what they see first of you yeah. you know it's like i mean that's that's just that's just what an individual does it's like we tend to start forming a judgment based on the information we start getting off off something yeah. you know and that's yeah. not uh but i but i i totally uh understand what you're saying because it's like whether it's subject matter or the medium it's like if somebody sees a work of you the the whatever that work is whether charcoal whatever the subject matter yeah. the person that sees work is like oh my god you're the one that did this you know yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if they like it and stuff which is you know it's obviously it's endearing and uh, like you said you know you one is still of course grateful that that um the person remembers you and everything you know so like that's still a good thing for sure yeah um okay all right so all right mr park what is art what is art um mm -hmm. uh, art is I think art is an outward expression of an emotion. Okay. Uh, and an outward expression of an opinion or feeling. And, you know, those things, those expressions, I think for me are visual. Uh, and I like to experience music, and so music is also an expression uh, of, of art, artistic expression. Poetry, writing, all these things. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so then outward, so all right, so what you said is outward expression of emotion, opinion, or feeling. So that would Sounds be. Correct. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I took a note quickly, and I think that's <laughs> exactly what, that, that's what you said. Okay, so then I, I want to try to like uh, think about it a bit more and see if I understand. Um, so then it's so then it's like the output, um, the output of something a person might feel or think about uh, anything. Does that seem right? So like. So like maybe some like maybe the person that wants to, uh, you know, exert the output. You know maybe there's maybe there's no words or maybe there's no sounds and like in the case of us you know visual artists we draw and show visually, the the feeling or the thought, because it definitely happens to me that um, 
when I'm drawing, when I'm drawing for something, when I want to, you know, effectively talk about something in a drawing, it's, it's not necessarily things that I can describe verbally. It's like that kind of comes afterwards, like while I'm working on the thing that with the internal dialogue and just like, you know, like that internal, you know, whatever's going on in, in my head while I'm drawing the thing, it, it kind of starts to then when I understand a little bit more and not, not every time, but you know, sometimes it does happen that I start to understand verbally what it is that I'm trying to talk about in the drawing that I'm like, oh, okay, so like this aspect of the neck or like the head or, you know, whatever the shoulder girdle, like this type of stuff is like, oh my God, this sloping thing. <laughs> and even then the, the words aren't like super refined or anything, but it's like, they start becoming words, but they're definitely first an image, you know? So then, okay. So like that definitely makes a lot of sense um, about how it's the output, uh, an individual trying to put out effectively something they feel or something they think about. So then, okay. So then what would you say in your case, what kind of stuff would you say that you're trying to output? Uh, what, what would you say then is like your, your outward expression, uh, you know, with your subject matter, what would you say? Yeah, that that's that's the question I think that I ask myself every day. That's the biggest question. And you know, I think for a long time, the uh, majority of thoughts contained in my mind were uh, to to understand and to depict light. And that was it. You know, that light. Was my, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know. That was, and still is, uh, you know, very, very uh, very heavy, very important aspect of, you know, literally every mark that I make is I'm thinking about light. And, you know, there are stages of understanding it, and I think there are stages of digging the, the data of, of all of what light means and how it physically, you know, manifests itself, how it metaphorically manifests itself. Um, and so, yeah, I'm trying to illuminate uh, the space that I'm creating. And so if I'm, you know, the subject matters, they, they shift. That's not a subject matter like I was briefly mentioning is you know, urban environments, people, animals. Um, and I think at a deep at, at the deeper level, uh, slightly than that, is to depict the light that illuminates that information, that scene, you know, that composition to allow for Whoever you know, I'm showing this to. I mean, even just to myself, how that creates that space. And so, every stroke, every mark that I make is the final result of uh, of many decisions made to, to bring out each composition's light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, okay. I, uh, all right. So I feel like that's kind of the, cause uh, you said something about the physical manifestation, I guess, of light, you know, like what light is versus the metaphorical, um, so then do you, do you, I mean, have you like done any kind of reading or research about what light is, because uh, I did a little bit of that for for a drawing class that uh, I was teaching and I, I'm planning on teaching again. Uh, and and the reason I started looking into that was because I was trying to figure out why ballpoint pen or just you know whatever color in general fades in the sunlight. And then I was like, all right, so then, but what is light and uh, this relationship with the uh, color particles or whatever it is like the the entire electromagnetic spectrum does things to the particles of color. Um, something like that. I, I don't remember now. I'm obviously going to have to uh, review that again. But it turns out that light 
and really the uh it's just a part of the electromagnetic spectrum and, and it's like crazy it's crazy it's like some it's like way over my head in terms of you know, it'll take way more effort for me to get it, you know, so like, I guess I just wonder, you know, because you're talking um, about light and the importance, it's, it's the importance of its role in your work. So like, I wonder if you've done like more quote unquote sciencey type of research on the subject. Just visual science, I guess, if I were to do any scientific, I mean, I wouldn't even call it research. It's just how light, how light Falls, how light looks mm. like, what it looks like when it falls. Mm. What does it look like if it is diffused light versus what does it look like if it's direct light, sunlight versus artificial light, mm. uh, you know, uh, spotlight versus, you know, uh, incandescent light or something. Like those, those things, right? Um, I guess staging or like, uh, illustration because I, I teach classes uh, around animation and illustration mm. so you know when they talk about when we talk about light in that situation it's a little bit more about uh, storytelling or cinematic or you know theatrical mood or mood yeah mm. um, those things um, but really just the, the reason I bring up light uh, is because that seems like at the moment, you know, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not the the master that I want to become yet. So mm -hmm. like I can't say you know for certain, but at the moment it, it has come to this point of understanding uh, what drawing is to me. You know, um, it's has gone through many stages of realizations and understandings and failures uh, and successes to at this point I understand that really all I am all I am really concerned about is, is the light. Mm. That without light, a drawing or a painting or a sculpture cannot exist. Mm. Even if yep. it does exist, you can't see it. Or yep. even if the light yeah, even the object that I'm drawing or even conceiving in my imagination know without light there's nothing there's no visual yeah but that's a whole other thing that i've been thinking about a lot too it's like you know there's light everywhere there's light all the time um but really that's that's what allows us to see even if you don't you know you know what i mean like light yeah light, light is very very essential to our to everything yes any i mean i've Gone down the rabbit hole thinking about this stuff. Like the sun, if the sun didn't exist, like the earth wouldn't be able to live and survive. Um, but if it's too strong, then it will all die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like right amount of light, you know, that perfect amount of light that this earth uh, needs. And that's a whole other thing that I used to think about. So, like, you know, it's very interesting. It's mm. very um, entire. Yeah. Very, uh, yeah, it's all encompassing. You know, life is really something that I think is everywhere, is everything. And I think the more I can understand what that means to me and my art, uh, I think the better my art can be. Mm -hmm. But that's at this moment in time in my life. Yeah, my yeah. Level of understanding of, you know, like what I've been doing. Okay, so in that case, do you think you could say, do you think it's possible that in that case, the subject matter of your work is light rather than necessarily uh, urban spaces, humans, animals, you know? So that's what I'm trying to get, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, it's not about what I'm drawing. Yeah. It's not about what it is that I'm making it. Uh, it really never was about that. Mm. Um, always about just how I depict, how I draw what I'm doing. And sometimes, you know, materials, mediums, so if I'm using this material, that 
will allow me to make this kind of atmosphere, this kind of this is another medium that'll allow me to, to dab into, you know, this kind of texture. So then it'll be closer to expressing this kind of feeling or mood. Um, so yeah, of course, all those things revolve around uh, why I choose what I do. Uh, but more and more now, so in the past, it used to be way more about like, oh, how am I going to render that form? Mm -hmm. The skin and or from some hair coming out of it or fur or wet or you know, shiny. But now it's, it's like, you know, why does it look like that? Mm. And what in my, you know, toolbox uh, or in the, all the possibilities of marking materials can I use to you know, express that, that light? Mm. Not about that object anymore. You know, like I used to hear this, I still hear this a lot from students, and I feel like I used to say this too when I was a, a young, young student. Like, oh, I hate drawing feet or. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Draw hands at this angle or, or things like that, you know? Yeah. But like, oh, if the head is tilted like this, oh man, I can't draw that angle. It's like, yeah, it's so weird and challenging, huh? Yeah. And <laughs> I totally felt that way too. But if you broaden your, if I, once I have broadened my perspective of, of looking at the world, uh, instead of looking at the world, you know, one object at a time, to expand my brain to think about everything as as forms and as planes and as surfaces and as angles and as textures and the bigger I can cast a net over all of the information uh, then I can just think about the light and if I just concentrate on the light it doesn't really quite <laughs> I'm trying to say this right. You know, like all, I mean, of course, all of the struggles that I, I have suffered, <laughs> uh -huh. just like many students suffer, learning anatomy, learning perspective, learning how to do all these things one by one. And, you know, uh, at least that's the way that I learned, you know, one thing at a time and trying mm. to like connect this one to this, this one, yeah, yeah. that one to that one, like, and try to do all three at once and see if it works and it breaks down and it's like, what did I do wrong? It's always this feels like this juggling game, you know. If I can juggle one thing really well, then I can learn how to put another piece in there. Mm -hmm. If I can get really comfortable, then I can then I can add another piece. Um, and so I think it is definitely through all of that struggle, uh, I'm trying to understand components and compartments of the visual uh, image that the attempt is natural me to think broader, to think uh, more as a director than uh, a crew member of my mm -hmm. Yet, my, my body is my crew, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, it makes me go, go there, and it also makes the things that I used to think were important uh, I realize they're not important, right? Mm -hmm. Ways of thinking, uh, things to practice, ways to practice, uh, of what to look for, what to think about when I'm drawing, uh, has also, I think, over the years, have broadened. And I think part of that also is this, like, I don't need to make, I don't need to, prove myself every five minutes. Mm. Like, you mean like I don't need to like throw everything into every little piece of the drawing because there are parts of the drawing that should not be paid attention to as, as much as other parts of the drawing in mm. the sense of overworking it or so you know mm. I, I remember doing a lot of overworking drawings when I was like, you know, whereas now I think I'm more or uh, inclined to think about the balance of the drawing as a mm. whole composition uh, more so than a 
Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. Um. Right. What? I don't know if that made any sense. It did. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, it's just that um, I, I want to ask you other stuff, but then it's like there, there's not really that yeah, much time. Yeah, um, But, okay, so then, uh, Mr. Guno Park, what is beauty? What is beauty? Mm. Um, yeah, I thought about this question because I know you, I know you asked the question. Uh, beauty is uh, what I think is beautiful. What you think is beautiful? Yeah. Okay. I think everything has the potential of being beautiful. Uh, and, um, what was that last bit? Depending on who's looking at it, or depending on who thinks about it. Uh -huh. you know, I think beauty is something that is close to your heart, um, that makes you think about it or them. Uh, beauty is something that, you know, takes away uh, all these other thoughts in your mind and makes you concentrate on it, like makes you really focus in on it, allows you to focus, allows you to feel a sense of clarity, you know. I think that's beauty in anybody, right? And beauty is is different for every single person. Mm. I think beauty is is elusive. You know, it's it's elusive. It's it's ever changing. You know, it doesn't not it's not definable for any one person. You know. Okay. Um, why is it elusive? moving around you can't capture it you can't pin it down you can't, you can't define it you can't say black and white here this is what beauty is you know, don't you agree i mean i i think that's that might be like an aspect of beauty yes um i mean that's that's kind of like that's part of why I started the the podcast because I I don't really understand what what art or beauty are, are. um so I'm, I'm trying to kind of it, you know the podcast is kind of like research on, on yeah. the on the subjects uh, I don't know what beauty is but I think uh so far I've been able to kind of um, gather one or two or you know like a handful at least of aspects that are part of the whole that beauty might be because uh, you know there's for sure there's the physical as the physical aspect meaning what we see you know sometimes beauty can be seen through you know a collection of attributes or characteristics um, be, uh, you know, and, and like that aspect of beauty kind of makes, in a way, it, it makes art a carrier of beauty, you know, sometimes. that That's possible. Like that, that I think is an aspect of beauty. And other times, there is no such thing necessarily attached to it, the experience of beauty. Sometimes it's a feeling brought on by a situation an experience, a uh, memory, uh, and sometimes it's both together, you know, um, I, I think, you know, and uh, I definitely agree that beauty is different for, at, at least in the physical appearance characteristic aspect, uh, I, I do think it's possible that varies for all different, you know, different individuals, different groups of people or whatever. Um, I, I don't know about the, as the, how much that varies between people, because, um, there's, there seems to be some kind of scientific evidence. And I mean, not that I've read a ton into that, because, uh, you know, I carefully choose the things that I invest my time in 
and I'm not sure that I have really that much time to read that kind of study, but uh, there's there seems to be something about physical beauty, like, you know, men and women, physical beauty of men and women to be really rather consistent cross-culturally, cross-time, whatever. And I think that is extremely interesting because it seems to be attached to our survival. I think that's extremely interesting. And also, I also like the idea derived from that, that it isn't, uh, not, not just that it isn't entirely different for everyone, but that it isn't as simplistic as we like to think that it's like, oh, it's uh, cultural. <laughs> That like that is such an over so oversimplification of something that is very old and wise, which is you know evolution and nature. It's like evolution and nature know way more than we can know in our very short lives, you know. Um, but then also the what I'm what I'm pretty sure is very or convinced at least that I'm I'm pretty certain of my hypothesis that the feeling elicited by um, you know an experience or whatever, you know, when that kind of stuff feels beautiful, like what you feel when you see a sunset or when you are, you know, a very intimate situation, like I'm, I'm pretty sure that that feeling elicited is just that feeling of that of beauty is I'm, I'm pretty convinced or at least I speculate and I'm pretty convinced of it that it's very similar from individual to individual. It's like if, if there's for sure common ground in beauty, it's I feel like it's there for sure, you know. But you know that's that's just like my hypothesis. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with the idea that there is maybe a commonality mm. in, in emotions and feelings. You can you can probably you know maybe witness that when you see, let's say, like you know I don't know Michael Jackson performing and like. Yeah millions and millions and millions of people fully agree that like that's good you know and that's yeah. real good that he's awesome yeah right. that he's great or like a movie that that is so popular that like millions of people will watch it and praise it um so commonality wise in the sense of visual beauty or audible beauty or you know the sensation that you uh, are commonly like with, with other common common people are experiencing together uh, there is common beauty I think. Mm. Um, but perhaps I'm not the, the beauty that I'm the individualistic beauty that I'm talking about or, or wanting to dive into in, in, in my thoughts is not so much something that maybe people don't even realize mm. Maybe, maybe it's not, and, and yeah, you bring up nature and, you know, history and, and, you know, all the years of nature, all of the time that we won't experience uh, and what truly, truly it means and survival, uh, all that stuff, commonality. But uh, I think true beauty, I, I think it's something deeper than that. I think that is a version of beauty. There is this common version of beauty, uh, but there's something that, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I like to believe that, that, that every individual has Their own frequency of receiving that very specific kind of beauty. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. No, I mean, um, I mean, uh, obviously, everyone has like their own flavor, in the mm -hmm. sense that at least you know, if it wasn't because of that, then, I mean, that's why artists, everyone makes different stuff because uh -huh. the flavor that we have for what is attractive and beautiful varies a little bit from person to person, for sure. It's like, I, I can totally, I can totally understand and see why somebody, why uh, it's very, it's very, it's a very, a pretty common belief that, uh, com or commonly said that 
beauty is in the eye of the beholder because I mean everybody has a different a different taste it's like n not everybody is attracted to the same type of person and this kind of stuff um, there's definitely that aspect to it to it as well and and, and like again it's like um, beauty has different facets to it and that is for sure part of those part of the facets that uh, beauty has although although I'm not entirely sure if that's exactly what you're referring to necessarily uh -huh. I think I, I think you know I'm a I, I think I'm also this this way and I think I don't know maybe almost everybody I know probably <laughs> I can't say for sure but like we are affected by whatever we're exposed to or yeah whether we choose to or not and so there is definitely a, a, a level of conditioning uh, that we all are going through in our visual lives and audible lives but we hear not by will but just by having something on or being at a certain place and you listen to something or you know your advertisements or you know you go to different places and you see different things um and so there is conditioning and there's manipulation and there's a lot of smart visual psychologists and scientists that are figuring this stuff out like sure. I have uh, known friends over the years who are uh, marketers and advertisers who actually study psychology and study visual psychology, and they are the managers of their uh, ad campaigns, mm. and they win awards, and uh, they've told me stories of how they sit in boardrooms and discuss ideas on what color, how many seconds per cut, what uh, light, what value, what shapes uh, uh, evoke these types of emotions in people and mm. specifically use those things to manipulate people to then click on the link or to go to that store or to think of their company as something they want you to think of it as. Mm -hmm. So it's 100% out there constantly in our faces. Mm -hmm. you know? Of the people are basically telling us this is beauty, this is beauty, this is beauty, this is what beauty is. Uh -huh. And so, I I believe that we're we are uh, kind of losing in in a sense of like having the freedom to to pick and choose what we deem deep inside as beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, amongst that, it, it it definitely makes it kind of uh, murky and hard to define, but. You know, I think that's why I think the deeper you look and uh, the practice of art that I'm doing, just like the practice of, you know, all the drawing and techniques and skills now coming to the point of me thinking broader and looking at more, more about light and thinking of more about the space and the light. Like that whole journey, I think, is a huge part of me discovering my beauty, what my beauty is. Mm -hmm. And the more and more I uh, can dig into that and, and understand myself uh, within the th thinking about what beauty is to me, uh, the broader I get, the, the, the better I get at understanding myself as an as a image maker, um, my idea of beauty gets further and further and further away from that, that, that idea that I used to buy into, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? and it becomes more and more unique. And I don't know what the final, uh, I don't think there is a final, you know, I think that uh, only, I think there is a beauty in just the pursuit of it. It's not, Oh yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not in, in it to define it or to pin it down, mm. uh, but I am definitely intrigued by the idea because, I mean, what do we do as artists, right? And I try to, to talk about this to all my students, too. Like, of course, yeah, we, we spend all this time in our studios trying to figure out what to make and how to make it the best that we can make it. But, you know, like, ultimately, you're going you're gonna to have to show it to somebody. Mm. You know, I think that's a huge part of art that uh, I grew up not thinking about as much. You know, I only thought about showing art and, and you know, aside from the, the, the context of, like, like a like a commercial art, like do a bunch of commercial art as a younger artist. Um, but now, as an individual, like I'm representing myself, uh, you know, mm -hmm. how 
I have to think about the audience and I have to think about what I'm saying, how I'm saying it. The more people that uh, I have the privilege of showing my work to, um, the more, um, you know, I'm little by little as a con I'm contributing to the visual culture, mm. you know? And so, you know, maybe not as go as far as like being responsible, but, you know, I have to think about how it's being perceived out there and, you know, what is being perceived and what I'm saying. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, we have hit and passed the one hour mark, okay. Mr. Park. And cool. uh, so I really like that ending point of thinking about one's work yep. as it's perceived or what you're trying to say with the work as a point to close the episode. So, uh, yeah. Guno, please tell our viewers and listeners what you're up to lately, where your work can be found. Do you have any projects, whatever it is that you want to plug or talk about? Oh. oh. Um, what am I doing these days? Uh, I, have a, I have a couple things. I mean, I, I have a, a Guno Park bundle. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, this is kind of like a, like a, like a business, like, Plug, plug. Yeah, do uh, it. No, but it's cool because it's a company that I used to, I've been, like I said, you know, I've been using Zebra pens for years, you know, I can't even remember how many years. Um, and the more and more uh, I did drawings with them, I shared my drawings on my social media that I, that I did, oh, I did these drawings with the Zebra pen. Uh, I started working with them uh, a number mm -hmm. of years ago. Um, different things, you know, like, fun things, fun projects, posts, articles. Uh, I've written a bunch of articles for them so they can post like little tutorials on how I use my pen to draw and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but recently, um, I was, uh, we partnered up and uh, we released the Guno Park Bundle where I just chose a few of my favorite zebra pens and uh, they kind of packaged it up in a, in a, in a box a package with a couple prints of my drawings that oh that is really it. cool yeah and a little little postcard with my picture on it and like uh -huh. you know a little blurb <laughs> about who i am and what i do and why i like to use pen so that's out there that's kind of cool that you know? is really cool <laughs> <laughs> um i've been teaching quite a bit i've been really busy um teaching i'm so fortunate to be able to uh, you know, teach at New York County of Art and to teach at Art Center and to teach at Marymount College um, with three schools at the moment. Um, but in June, uh, mid-June, in a couple of weeks, I have a short little workshop coming up. Mm -hmm. That's like a, a new thing with the New York Academy of Art with John Boak, uh, his department. Continuing education, right? Continuing education, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's like a weekend thing where. Is it a uh, master class? No, no. It's a just, workshop. Just a short workshop. Two day okay. workshop, yeah. yeah. So one day is at the academy. We look at some animal stuff and we draw in class. And then the second day is we go to the natural history museum. So I think okay. That's coming up. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff coming up, but uh, not quite ready to announce yet. So okay, fair enough. I'll be I'll be announcing that um, those stuff in my probably in my. Interview. All right. Well, uh, the link to your website and your Instagram are going to be in the description uh, oh, for nice. anyone that's interested. So that's really awesome, and it's also really inspiring that you're just like just continuing to plow through because you've always been really or like you know the the time that i've known you you've always been very productive and prolific and that's very inspiring so that's the perception huh okay yeah i mean <laughs> yes <laughs> that is my percep my perception at least <laughs> yes so well i really want to thank you aguno uh, for for uh talking to me for a little while here um i don't know and you know spending about an hour with me out of your yeah. busy schedule i really appreciate it Thank you for your, uh, for your time, for your words and your thoughts. Thank you to everyone that is going to watch this video. Thank you for joining us. Feel free to let Guno and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments section. And I also invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because more of these conversations are coming.
I also invite you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals. If you want to support Guno, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links will be in the video description. So thank you everyone again and see you next time. Bye. Bye.